So I thought it's about time we make a full track. And of course, we've just put Starlight out, perfect to do a Freemason style track. So let me show you how I made this. We're going to do this tutorial in Logic, but this, all these techniques will work inside of any DAW. So that's the main part of the music, and then some vocals come in and join later on. And there is an interesting little B section where the music flips. An awful lot of you have asked about arrangements. So let's take a step away from the DAW and use a pen and paper to explain how I've put this together. So I've made a pen and paper diagram here of the main arrangement. We've got three main drops, drop A, drop B, and drop C. And what I want to do is get them each a little bit bigger each time. The whole purpose of a track like this is that it constantly rises in energy and power as we go through the whole thing. That's how you build emotional excitement within a track. So apart from these main drops where we're going around the whole part of the main music, we've got an intro, an outro here and these two separate building sections. Now what I want to do is do slightly different things between these two builds and have a much simplified version on the intro. Now to do that, the first thing I always did if we were ever sampling uh, disco records or remixing or anything like that is get the main part of the music working and then see if there's like one bar that you can loop around on a simplified form. Now what's great here is because these main drops have two main chords on them, we can basically build an intro on just one chord and one chord and one chord and then to add some movement we can then swap over to a simplified or filtered version of the two chord. Then we can kind of have a mini breakdown where we build up here build some energy up before you slot in. Then we can repeat this kind of plot throughout just doing separate things. So this is a way of creating a classic A and B section. So you've got the main part where it's all kicking in and then these builds. And then as I say, if you produce this properly and start introducing more and more components as you go through, you constantly raise the power of the track. So let's have a look at that now in action. Here's a really interesting and simple little trick. See if you can flip round just one version or one bar of the music. So let's just solo round a few things. Now the strings are actually quite a main part of that and they're, they're hitting a note that sort of means that things are in full flight. So I'm just going to mute the strings for a minute. You see, we found a loop that we know that can work at the front, and that's exactly what I've done at the front of this track. So I've started with the bass and some of the music and used the Volcano Filter from Fab Filter. Now the music you're hearing there is in this little group and there I've got these one bar chops on some of the music. But as you see, the actual edits that I've done here change and you go into a longer section. So what I'm basically doing for all of the part that I've got highlighted now, this bit is I'm running around on just one note and slowly opening up filters so you get that feeling of build. And then for the second part of the build up, I go into the two chord sequence. Thank you. 
Now, here's something really important to understand. Because of these simple two chords that we know loop up, so in other words, these two bars here run around the first chord, that one is the second chord, but we know that we can put a four bar loop on it and it's gonna go round perfectly. That means later on in the build up, we could just hang on this second chord. And sometimes just surfing about and finding the best loops is a great way to get ideas for the build-up. And that's exactly what I've done later on down here. So if I'm soloing just the music again now. And right there is how you can build a really simple but powerful piece of tension within a two chord structure like this. Now, obviously, some of the samples you might use or other bits from sample packs like Starlight might actually have four bar sequences in it. But that's one thing to try. Go and look at the last bar of the musical sequence and see if you can extend it out so then it resolves back into that first note. And then when it hits all of the music in full flight, if you want to repeat and have a double section, you need to do something slightly different on the second. And what I've got here are a couple of little tricks. Running underneath everything here is this little loop that I call an air loop. And it's just a little top end sequence that adds a little bit of interest. For the second time the music goes all the way round, there's this thing called Born Strings, which is a patch that I pulled out of uh, Tracks Electric Disco 2. So it's like a high sustained string, and because it creates a really simple tonality, and I believe it's going to the root note of this piece, which is G, and then it's bending down by a musical fifth so it fits with the chords. Sometimes you can just hold the whole thing on just one note. But it means at this second part of the music, there's going to be an added layer of top end information. And getting that right and working out how to do these dynamic builds can be an extraordinarily powerful way. And then, of course, we can bring in the vocals. Now, these vocals are all vocoded and and they've come from a Roland G synth V2, which has the technology from the old uh, V sampler that Roland put out, which is kind of real time time stretch. It's got this brilliant robot mode that allows you to put vocals in there and play them a little bit like Daft Punk vocals. Now, these were quite complicated to get in, as all vocals are when a track's in full flight, because as you can hear, this is a full range production. There's an awful lot of stuff going in. And I'll show you uh, some of the tricks later on of how we kind of wedge that in. So there, we've got this kind of repeat of the main part of the music. And just to signal that it's coming, I've done what a drummer would do, is basically create a little drum fill. But this one's so simple, it's painful. It's just basically a double kick drum beat on the first beat of the bar and then you cut the kicks out. Let me show you what I mean. And actually I put a cymbal, it's just there, a really short cymbal on that second kick. So it goes dum -psh. That was something I can't take credit for. I nicked that years ago of a mate of mine called Alan Bremner, a brilliant producer. I heard him do it once on a, uh, on a track and I'm thinking, I'm having that. That's an excellent little fill. And here is the trick to all of this. Every time you come to the end of a 4, 16 or 32 bar round, try and do some edits that do something slightly different. Like there, there's just a little bit of some of the loops cut out and things like that. And here's another example. <laughs> So it's these end of the bar sections that you want to concentrate your production in and you're basically leading people onto the next section. And one of the most powerful ways you can do it is instead of just adding information, is taking stuff out. Now we could go further in this, we could take some of the sub out of the bass part on that. I've got it on a different track here because it needs processing slightly differently as it goes to a different note in that section.
and you see those moments of contrast, anything you can do there just to slowly take a few things away will allow your kick, the actual point where the beats come back in, to have real impact. And this is all about emotions in a club. And if people are in the right mood with your track, it is just dopamine central. So all of these things come into play. Okay, and because we built our first section around a one-bar loop, we can go back into it. Records like this love to come in and out of sections, almost like a dance between the A and B. So we're looping round at the beginning, and then we come back out into the full chord sequence. Okay, so I've done something quite interesting here. I've wanted to create a warmer feel for this, not so much just a full-on thing, a really nice one of those beautiful summer day disco moments. Now, I've got a real Rhodes in the studio here, so I played in some live Rhodes parts, but you also can see up here that I've got some live percussion. Now, these were recorded quite simply with a USB microphone, uh, and just hitting away on a couple of things that I had in the studio. I also added a vibra slap with a ton of reverb on. But now let me just play you the roads in solo. You hear how I'm kind of strumming across the notes of the chord there? This is quite easy to do in MIDI if you need it, and you hear there's a ton of uh, chorus and phase on there. That's a classic disco road sound. If you want that nice, warm feeling, get out your modulation plugins and go to town. I actually did this with pedals, but you can easily do this with road samples and a ton of modulation. But I've also overlaid an octave on the chord. So we've got the lower part. And you see I've kind of strummed one and not the other. And I'm lucky. I can play. I've taught myself keyboards a long time ago. That means I can actually play the repeat parts with the roads. Now, this does something really interesting. It kind of just takes away from the machine-like uh, action of just cutting things up on the page. And as you can hear, I'm not 100% in time, but that add, all adds to the fun of it. And it's one of the reasons why this build-up sounds quite natural. But it also means for this second build-up, which goes back into the main section, we're doing something slightly different from that intro. But we've also kind of got a, a false breakdown just before that build-up where I'm taking some of the drums up. There's a gaping hole here. What I'm also doing is adding the strings. So we're kind of adding to the lushness, but taking some of the drums away. But most importantly, we're keeping the kick going. So it's still a section for dancing. It's just enhancing that richness of the music. And then we're into that build up and back out again. And from there on, the Rhodes is playing quite regularly throughout. So even if you take a visual look between this section and this section, you can see there's slightly more in this second section here. But I have actually not done a full four times repeat of the music. I've just run it around three times. But as I say, it's all about kind of building things up, just seeing how many extra parts you can wedge in effectively without overpowering it. If we go to the end, you can see everything's in there at this point. Now, I did make an awful lot more recordings of percussion.
So that's quite a section by itself. Now, the congas, uh, I've got a set of practice congas here. I just mic them up with a nice microphone. Uh, I only brought one of them in and I was able to create this pattern. As you can hear, it needed an awful lot of quantize and a bit of tasty editing. Here's a perfect example of the percussion page that I built to record extra bits on. So all I've done is bounced out a two track version, take your limiters off whilst you do this and make sure you still got some headroom. And then you can record over the top and use all of the things like flex time or warping to edit the percussion in. And the great thing about doing it this way is that you've completely released all of the processing of your computer. You're back to kind of square root one. And particularly when you're putting things in record with a live mic, you want absolutely zero latency if you can get it. And this is the way to do it. Then I build up these additional pages. Concentrate on just them, use plugins for uh, getting everything right. I kind of then bounce everything down. I can then bring these in in Logic. Now, every DAW has a way to do this. Logic's is quite simple. I just basically navigate to the place on the desktop where the uh, edited project is. I can open it. Then I can select the tracks I want, including the plugins and automation and all of that jazz, and just add them to the project. And obviously, as long as the two projects have everything lined up in terms of bars, then it's all in the right place. And then you can just pick all this stuff up and start rearranging it. So here's the end of the second drop. And instead of going Going into that musical change, I'm going into a repeat of the last chord as we were doing on the builds. So again, we're going into a richness, but we've stripped it right down to a, a typical kind of disco extended dub section where basically it drops to the percussion, the drums and the bass. And to build up to a crescendo, we're doing that uh, hold again on the last chord. But then we, instead of just bashing straight into it, I actually stop and we use a string run. And those extra two bars there just bring that little bit of musical tension because it basically lasts two bar longer than you were thinking. So it's like, ah, what's going to happen? Then you get the drum fill and you know where you are. Now, I have seen kickback ins much more dramatic than this and take much more dramatic steps in terms of production. But I find with anything that's really groove based like disco, you don't want to go too crazy and you want to get them back into dancing as soon as you possibly can. Bearing in mind, this is all about re emotional response. And just having that additional two bars in there means that it's a little bit more tension than the other build up so far. Now, you hear that string run? Believe it or not, that is a plug-in. Let me show you that right now. This came into my life uh, a few months ago. This is the SWAM modelled string section. Yes, you are hearing that right. This is a physically modelled string section. This is what it can do. I'm just going to let that sink in. There's no samples involved in this. This is a physically modelled violin section. I think it's absolutely extraordinary. I've also copied that an octave up. And to get that kind of disco pull, I've just used a, let's get it here, it's a little pitch bend four, there it is. It's actually just nicking up a little bit, the reason being, it's for some reason just in its legato engine, it was sounding a little flat there, so I just tweaked it. And then I doubled that up with a viola. I've pulled up an LFO here, I've got a random waveform, smoothed it out a bit, added a bit of jitter, and as you can see, I'm just feeding that into the master tuning of this plugin. What that's doing is adding some natural variation. And whenever you've got a group of musicians playing together, you will get that naturally. So if you can emulate it, you'll have a more realistic part. So add that together, what do we get? Isn't that extraordinary? A full 
disco string run using no samples. And the other reason why I popped into Ableton here, it's sometimes nice to just move away from the one bit of software you're using, but also obviously Ableton's excellent at handling loops. And I just added a few more bits in here. So here's some of the parts that I added. And I use this from Wave Tracing. It's the SP950. So obviously it's a kind of play on words between the SP1200 and the S950. And it's just adding a little bit of grit to things. So I've also used this a couple of times. It's the S12X uh, from Beat Skills, and it emulates the sound of an SP1200 when you um, put a record in at the wrong speed and then play the sample back slower. Uh, instead of having to go through all of that nonsense, you just basically move this slider up to get more crunch. There's so many little processes like this turning up at the moment that can add that layer of crunch that we sometimes miss from those classic French and disco house productions. So when a production gets busy like this was when I was putting it together, I'll often go and run those pages like that. So here's some of the extras that we pulled in from that additional page. So these only appear actually at the end of the track. So again, we're just lifting off. Just like this diagram, we're trying to make everything just rise. This is what will make people remember your tracks. It is a skill to try and get all of this stuff balanced, but it's time well spent learning how to do it. And for the end of the track, we go around the second musical section and then basically reverse the intro. <laughs> And you hear all of the music just kind of melt away there. Well, we've developed a whole series of tricks over the years to help us to do that. And here's one of them. Um, this is the bass and it's filtering down with Volcano. But at the same time, uh, the low frequencies are being cut off in the second part as well. So those two filter points kind of come up to meet each other and that's why that just literally disappears. And one thing whilst I'm here, uh, you hear that bit crushing that's going on at the top. This is actually on an auxiliary send. So I've got this on bus two going into a bit crusher, uh, set with a bit crushing quite extreme. And then we've got some EQ just to take all the bottom off and to roll some of those additional high frequencies that the bit crusher is creating. Um, we've got Phasist from Native Instruments doing a great job phasing around. Now, all of the French house stuff that I love used to run around with lots of modulation and these were actually hardware devices. One of the famous ones is an Ensonic DP4 and I've got a DP2 here uh, that's got the phase algorithm in that was used an awful lot by the likes of Daft Punk and a lot of the French guys. Having a bit crushing send like this means that I can put a load of music into it and get some great results. And I've got the emulation of the Mutronix filter, an analog filter that was all around in the 90s. I'm then actually using Sooth 2 to get rid of some of the harsh frequencies out of it. A little bit of EQ and I've got, I'm pulled out a resonance that I didn't like here and actually use that to drop the level. This means that I can keep the fader of the auxiliary return around zero. That's its most useful part. Um, so instead of dealing with faders that are kind of all the way down there, which is an absolute nightmare. I can make quite macro adjustments here. And then obviously I'm side chaining it. And on the bits where you've just got the bass, all of this kind of comes into play and just adds a layer of crust over the top.
Now, it's not much, but it is in there doing its thing, and it just really makes such a difference to these kind of productions. Okay, if we're mixing big, we're going to have to talk plugins, and I know it's a favourite subject of everybody. So what have I used here? Well, I wanted a really fat analogue-style bass end on this. Uh, I grew up on hardware. I love that sound, and particularly for this kind of music, it really works well. So one of the things that I started reaching for was this, the P440 Sweet Spot EQ from Pulsar Modular. I'm a huge fan of these guys because they've managed to really get some vintage and analogue mojo inside of code. As always with F9, we are never sponsored by plug-in companies. I want to make that perfectly clear. Let me show you what this is doing to the kick. It's really got some soul, this thing. Now, it's not an easy EQ to use. Uh, you actually have to do some learning to really get the best out of it. But it really hits hard on these kind of sounds. It's also on the bass. And I've used the output gain there. That's why you're hearing a level difference. Uh, I also used Kit Plugins MoQ. Now, this is basically an emulation of an old style of EQ that was used in the Motown era. And one of the reasons I love it is that these bands are wide and they're big and you get that real vintage sound. You can see I'm winding quite a bit of 50 hertz into this. Now, I've used another 440 EQ just on the master bus to push everything together. So in other words, I tailored back, or I pulled back some of the work I was doing on the kit and the bass individually and then reach for the master and then uh, added a little bit more bottom end here. And sometimes it's really useful to put your final bass moves on on the master fader. The reason being is that as the kick and bass are coming together there, any phase shifts that are caused by the EQ will happen together. So in other words, it's not going to change your individual relationship between your kick and your bass. Everything's going to move at the same time. And this often goes completely amiss in conversations. But nearly all EQs, apart from those that have um, phase linear modes, will actually change the phase of bass signals. So this is why it's often really useful to put a little bit on the, on the actual final master. And let's just hear the drums, effects and bass soloed. And yes, I am still using the dodgy old uh, built-in Logic E uh, compressor to do some side chaining. I've always found this Platinum Digital mode to be really, really fast. And actually, Jolly and Petch in Australia uh, always made me go back and actually have a look at it. He was uh, always very keen on this because it's really fast. So you've got a little bit more control when side chaining. So master bus compression, well, I'm using two here, the Eventide Omnipressor and the P11 Abyss from Pulsar Modular. This one is doing actually a lot of the work and it's one of the grabbiest compressors and that's why I love it for Disco House. You hear how it's sucking everything up? It's almost a mixture of top-down and bottom-up compression as well. Now, have a look at the controls here to see how I've set it up. I've got a 1.4 ratio here. Turn the threshold all the way up because it's coming in fairly loud. Uh, attack time is really slow, so I'm getting the bite, and then the release time is fast, and I've pulled the mix back a little bit. This is a perfect way for me to drive this compressor. So what's the P11 doing? It's just tickling on the tops, and it's great at bringing a little bit of extra detail out. So it's only a tiny amount of difference with this second compressor, but it's just bringing the fronts forward a little bit more. And this is the key to modern mixing. Do it in stages if you can. Now, there is one excellent little trick I want to show you on the, the build-ups and into the main section. Here's the string line by itself. Now, on the build-ups, I'm looping and doing chops here, but then I do something very clever, which I'll show you in a minute.
So this section that repeats fast here, I put that into a quick sampler. So I've just dropped it in there and set the loop points. I went to the modulation matrix and I made the mod wheel negatively affect the loop end. I've then automated the modulation wheel. And what that's going to do is bring this loop point in closer and closer and closer and listen to what it does. Now this can be done, I believe, on nearly any DAW's internal sampler. You're just basically finding a way to automate the loop point. But it sounds extraordinary in the track. And at extreme mod wheel setting, very short loop points, it will create completely different tones. Now I just quickly want to mention gain staging. Now I'm always working with a, a system here that I've got a hardware set of meters so I can see just by looking to the left of my screen uh, where everything actually is. It's using uh, this TC Clarity metering system so there's a little plug-in that I put right at the front of the master chain but also just for the purposes of this video so I can show you the actual levels going into the master system or the master fader I've also pulled up Logic's multimeter. Now this is actually a little bit hotter than I would normally like to mix, but it's just kind of crept up as I've gone through the final stages a little bit. But I tend to like it bouncing around at this point. Now it doesn't matter to me that we get small overs like this as long as it's not going too much far further, because uh, some of the analog model plugins are probably going to lop those off, and it's dead easy to control. Um, but this is a nice working relationship that I can actually add things to. But obviously one of the problems uh, with anything like this is if you've got a full thing occurring, a full track going, and then you're trying to add vocals. One of the things I've always done in big productions like this is to use some form of peak limiting or kind of maximizer just for the vocals. You do have to be careful about over limiting your groups, but for vocals, it can be vital. And this thing I found to be astonishingly good at it. This is the Mook DSP um, ML 4000. Look at it. What a beast, eh? It's a multi-band compressor and basically... What I tend to do is just bring that threshold down and then bring down the ceiling to balance it. I'll play you the vocals and I'll turn it on and off as we go through. So you just hear it's really good at bringing everything up. And by bringing that average level of the sound up, you don't have to have things actually pushing too hard into a, a, an already busy mix. Now you see this is actually pinning it to uh, an actual set point on here. And as I say, it's only really vocals that you want to do that kind of thing to. If you do it to drums or to basses, you will gather a whole load of clipping distortions up on your master fader. And because they're all tending to be happening at the same transient points, that can be really problematic. Your mix can fall apart and you'll get distortion early. But because vocals tend to be a little bit more raggedy in terms of timing and all of the rest of it, it doesn't really make too much difference when you you pin these things like this. But of course, you don't have to use posh plugins like that. Even the built-in limiter and logic would do a great job. So when I brought these snares in, obviously they're kind of overlaying on top of each other. So there's going to be a lot of transient spikes coming together. So I used a very simple form of compression here or basically limiting, which is the overdrive plugin. Just drove into it a little bit and pulled the output back down. So this is acting as a slightly different kind of limiter with an analog end to it, but it's controlling all of the peaks out of those snare risers. So you kind of get that natural compression that you get from distortion. It's pinning it again, so it's under control for the rest of the mix. But as I say, choose your battles wisely with that kind of limiting. Please do not go and limit every single group or compress every single group. You just don't need to. You just need to be aware that doing it on a few things will just help the mix come together and function properly.
So that's the end of this video showing you how I put this thing together. This track is totally free to download, as are a very basic set of stems. But if you buy F9 Starlight, I will include way more detailed stems into the actual download for that pack. But please note, just this part, in other words, the bits from this production that you're looking at here, are not royalty free. They are for educational purposes only, because I need to keep the copyright inherent within this actual production for YouTube ID systems, SoundCloud ID systems, and all of that stuff. Please don't grab the bits and just try and put it out. We will actually ask you not to if any of that occurs. We can only do these if everybody plays ball. And I want to do more of these walkthroughs and more of these track and stem outs later on with F9. So if you guys behave yourselves, then we can do more of this. I know from experience myself that if you have a set of reference stems, you can make sonic adjustments to your own work, flipping backwards and forwards between these. And that's what I truly hope these can be for you. So now let me just play you through this production.
that is a funky house record. <laughs> 